Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. He is the only mediator between God and men. That way and truth and life that comes to us today is found in Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45. Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him, and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. As soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. However, he went out and began to proclaim it freely, and to spread the matter, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. These are the words of our Lord. <coughs> Last week, Micah, my little Micah, entered my office and requested my help with an injury that he suffered. <coughs> to hear him describe it, you would, you would think that he'd need a, an ambulance and an emergency room visit, but in reality it was just a tiny scrape on the tip of his pinky. It actually wasn't even bleeding, but he was so distraught about it that he wanted a band-aid. He wanted to have it covered. And so we got a band-aid and we wrapped it up. And once we were all done, he remarked, it's okay, Dad. Jesus will heal it. He said it to me as if he needed to comfort and console me that I was worried something drastically bad was going to happen. I smiled and reassured him that, yes, Jesus would heal it. But I also reminded him, don't pick at the Band-Aid, because if you do, it's going to fall off. I'm going to need another one. But later on, about less than an hour later, he came to me and the band-aid was hanging off and he didn't quite listen to the instructions that I gave him. But through this whole thing, I couldn't also help but be amazed at the simplicity of, of his confession in Jesus. He said that Jesus could heal him with the greatest confidence and assurity that he absolutely believed that Jesus would heal him. There was no doubt whatsoever. Simply knowing that Jesus was going to take care of him was good enough for him. That's all he needed. Well, maybe a, a little band-aid to cover it so that he didn't have to look at it. He knew that Jesus was going to heal him even if the miracle didn't happen right away, right when he wanted it to happen. He knew it would take time, but he still trusted. And Jesus didn't perform the miracle right away. He used ordinary ways, ordinary means, like a band-aid, and like the function of our natural bodies, to heal the little cut. But also, Micah didn't listen to the advice I gave him. The band-aid didn't last very long until we needed a new one. It's pretty interesting that no matter what situation we come across in life, no matter what our ailment may be, we tend to react in the same way. We don't often question the ability and the power of Jesus to heal us, but sometimes we question the way that he does it. Sometimes we question how quickly he does it. Sometimes we don't listen to the instructions that he gives us moving forward. We know that our Lord and Savior can conquer any sickness, but it's often those very sicknesses that sap our spiritual energy and our willingness to listen to him. And sometimes we forget that sometimes, maybe oftentimes, Jesus will use the ordinary things in our lives to come to us and to speak to us and to reveal his will to us. Today we see a story where Jesus touched on both of these aspects, both on his ability and power to heal but also on the instructions that he gives us moving forward in our lives. 
We ask that He would send His Holy Spirit upon us today and enlighten our hearts through that Word. Our text before us deals with one specific ailment, leprosy. But Jesus also confronted many other diseases and sicknesses during his time here on earth. If you back up just a few verses in Mark chapter 1, we get a summary of what life was like for Jesus early in his ministry. Mark tells us that at evening when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door, that he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. Leprosy was only one of many sicknesses that Jesus came across. And while leprosy is not very prevalent for us today, especially in America, it was very common back then. And leprosy serves well as a good summary picture, a good disease to look at that's kind of above all other types of diseases because of how devastating it was. Leprosy, if we're not familiar with it, is a condition that affects our skin, uh, particularly at the extremities. And basically what it does is it rots your flesh away all the way down to the bone until there's nothing left. <coughs> And it keeps on spreading and spreading and spreading throughout the entire body. Leprosy is obviously very deadly and extremely contagious. Because of the deadliness of leprosy and the fact that there was no cure for it at Jesus' time, lepers were considered outcasts. The law stated that lepers had to be outside of the city. They had to live in their own compounds. And when they did go out into public, they had to completely cover themselves. One writer remarked that they had to cover themselves as if in lamentation of their own virtual death. It was almost as if they were marching in a funeral procession for their own funeral. Lepers couldn't approach people, couldn't talk to people, and whenever they came close to somebody, they had to shout, Unclean! Unclean! so that the other people could get out of the way. To many people, leprosy symbolized death. A person could still be living, could still be breathing and functioning and talking, and yet, with leprosy, they were literally decomposing. Because of all these things about leprosy, God had stringent laws about it in the Old Testament, just as Jesus referenced in our account to the leper about what Moses commanded through the Spirit. From Levit Leviticus chapter 13 we read, The leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, his head bare, he shall cover his face and cry unclean. All the days that he has the, sh the sore, he shall be unclean, and he shall dwell alone outside the camp. The primary purpose of this law was to keep the rest of the people safe from leprosy because it was extremely contagious. Really, when somebody was suffering from leprosy, they were literally in the hands of God. They really had no other alternative than to pray that God would heal it. There was no medicine or no cure. Ultimately, leprosy provides the clearest picture of what sin does to a person spiritually. Lepers were physical, walking, talking, breathing examples of what people's souls are like with sin. And God wanted to make it clear that he did not want his children to be involved in either one, leprosy or sin. Another writer puts it this way. He says, Leprosy was the outward and visible sign of the innermost spiritual corruption, a meat emblem of its small beginning, its gradual spread, its internal disfigurement, its dissolution little by little of the whole body, of that which corrupts, degrades, and defiles man's inner nature, and renders him unmeet to enter the presence of a pure holy God. There's no doubt that some of us cringe today at the idea of what leprosy can do to our physical bodies. I'm sure some of us may even think that it's really not a topic for discussion on a Sunday morning. But what we see through leprosy is a clear example of what sin does to our souls. If we're unwilling to talk about a physical disease, are we going to be willing to talk about the devastating effects of God's law in our lives, how it reveals the corruption and the decay of our sin? 
sadly there's too many today, that don't want to talk about the law because of the ugly picture that it brings, kind of like the ugly picture of leprosy. But the danger of sin is a much deadlier disease in our bodies. It's easy for us to ignore the problem of sin. Lepers had to deal with the problem because everybody could see it. But sin is a matter of our heart. Sin is something we can keep behind the scenes. Sin is something we can cover up to the eye of human intuition. But what God tells us is that it's just like leprosy. It's deadly. It's devastating. It's contagious. And if left unchecked, it's going to spread. This is why Jesus said later on in his ministry that those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Here Jesus calls sin a sickness. And he says, I have come to take care of that sickness. And so as he goes out and meets this leper here today in our text, he's not just meeting him on the level of his physical ailment, but he's meeting him also to deal with the spiritual ailment of his sin. From our perspective, there's many similarities between leprosy and sin. For one thing, lepers can't heal themselves. That's just like us in our sinful condition. We can't heal ourselves of our sin. There's nothing we can do no matter how hard we try, no matter how good we act, no matter how many man-made laws we set up in addition to God's Word, there's nothing we can do to heal ourselves from sin. Leprosy is also very contagious, just like sin. Very often, people learn how to sin by looking at others. People learn by example. Children learn from their parents. Friends learn from friends. Relatives learn from relatives. They see a sin and they think, oh, I never realized that before. I never knew I could try that. And so they learn by example. It's a contagious disease. And finally, if leprosy is not confronted, sometimes that means amputation. Sometimes that can mean medicine now in our modern age. But if it's not dealt with, it's going to spread. Sin, likewise, if not dealt with by repentance and forgiveness, is going to spread and spread until it completely overtakes us. The many parallels between leprosy and sin are clear, and they add a good emphasis to understanding in our text. Since this leper was both physically and ceremonially unclean, it was quite bold of him to approach Jesus. But that's the first lesson we need to understand. That's what the heart of faith does. That's what the heart that believes in Jesus does, is it boldly approaches Him with our problems. This leper, this leper risked his pride, risked his status in society, his understanding with others by approaching Jesus and asking Him for help. Sometimes we too, when we approach Jesus with our problems, take a risk in a way. We put our pride on the line. We maybe have to act in humility and lowliness, which isn't always easy to do. Sometimes it involves letting others know about the problems that we suffer with so that they can help us in the name of Christ. It's not an easy thing to do, but a faith that trusts in Jesus boldly approaches Jesus. And so the man confessed to Jesus, if you are willing, you can cleanse me, you can make me clean. With great confidence, this leper left his sickness in the hands of his Savior. He knew that Jesus had the power, but he also knew that Jesus knew best what was for him. He was content to say, your will be done. I leave it in your hands. I know you have the ability, but I'm not going to try to coerce you. I'm not going to try to force you to heal me. If only we always made our request to the Lord with the same confidence, the same attitude of faith, not only confessing His power and ability to help us, but leaving the matter at His doorstep, leaving it in His hands, ending our prayer with, Thy will be done. Having the humility to confess 
Lord, I don't have all the answers. I don't always know what's best for me. I trust that you can guide me. It shouldn't surprise us that things work the same way in our spiritual lives as they work here on this day for that leper. We who grew up as Christians and we who know so much about God's Word don't often doubt the power of that Word, don't often doubt our Savior's ability to accomplish that Word. We know that God is powerful enough to do anything. But there comes a point in our spiritual lives when we hit a wall, when we start to doubt whether God really wants to do the best thing for me. He can, but does He really care about me? God has the power to do this. I pray that God can do this, but He's not doing it in my life, so I must know something better than God does. We hit a wall. And because we hit this wall, we stop studying the Word, we stop listening to God, we start making up in our own minds what we think God is saying, what we think He should do. We start trying to convince ourselves that we know better. We start trying to convince God that we know better. And we hit the wall. One reason we hit a wall is because we're used to hearing the same messages again and again. Where they don't make the same impression that they used to. We don't work hard to try to delve out a deeper meaning on the texts that are so familiar to us that we've known our entire lives, that we've learned from little on. And so we hit the wall of complacency. We get lazy. And we think that something better is out there. Sometimes we hit the wall when we hear some new idea or new teaching or even a new religion or philosophy and we think, man, that sounds so much better than what I'm used to. The grass is greener on the other side. It's better. It's new. It's different. It makes me feel good. And we hit a wall in our true spiritual lives. We hit a wall in the real understanding about what God wants us to believe. Sometimes we hit a wall because... We don't act in humility. We get arrogant. We get prideful. We start to stoke our ego with how much we know about God's Word and how little others know and how much better of a Christian we are than everybody else and how much we don't need God's help anymore because we have it all figured out. And we hit a wall. Perhaps one of these examples resonates with you more than another. Perhaps you're thinking of something entirely different. But the case remains the same. As Christians, we all need to be careful about hitting a spiritual wall, about losing the momentum that we have in our faith in Jesus. We need to be aware of it because while faith needs to be strong, it needs to trust in the power of Christ, faith also needs to be humble. Faith also needs to say, Your will be done. I know you can cleanse me. I know you can do this, but I leave it in your hands. And we especially need to be aware of it because of sickness. Sickness both of the body, but also of the soul. Those who strengthen their faith day by day through the Word of God, those who build on their foundation, those who make themselves stronger in what they know about Christ, are ready to resist the sicknesses that come their way. This often happens with members of ours who are at an elderly age. You go throughout your entire life without sicknesses, being healthy and being vibrant, and all of a sudden as life nears its completion, sickness after sickness, ailment after ailment come upon you. How are you going to get past those things? Well, it's by strengthening your faith right away. It's by strengthening your faith from early on and getting it stronger and stronger and stronger through the Spirit's help, through the Word of God, so that when those ailments do come, when those sicknesses are faced, you could be strong enough to get through them. But it doesn't just work that way for your physical bodies either. The longer you live here on earth, the more spiritual sicknesses are going to be thrown your way. The more ailments Satan's going to try to hinder you with, try to drag you down, try to drag you so that you hit that spiritual wall, so that you forget that your Savior knows best. You may still be trusting in Jesus. You may still say, yes, Jesus has all power. But that doesn't mean anything if He hasn't given that power to your life. He, that doesn't mean anything for you if you don't trust in that power, if you don't listen to what He says. 
sicknesses, whether physical or spiritual, are not so scary on their own, one by one. But when you line them up together, when they hit you wave after wave after wave, like a ship on open water, that's when they take the toll. Strengthen your faith now while you have opportunity. Strengthen your faith so that when Jesus calls to you and that call makes an impression like it did for this leper, you're ready to respond by faith. King Solomon phrased it this way. He said, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, before the difficult days come, before the years draw near in which you say, I have no pleasure in them. Jesus calls you to you just as he did to that leper. He tells you that he's willing to cleanse you. That he has the power. That you can have confidence in the same hope, both for your body and your soul, no matter what happens to you. But he also says, don't hit the wall. Keep moving forward with that same confidence. Building on your sure and steady foundation. And to help you, Jesus does one more thing, just as he did for the leper. He points you in the right direction. Upon healing his leprosy, Jesus said to the man, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest, and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. One of the other laws about leprosy in the Old Testament was that in order to be verified as clean, a leper had to go show himself to the priest. And then, at that point, if he was clean, he could be accepted back in society. Jesus knew that this man would not have a good life, would not do very well if he was not returned back to society as well. It would have been very easy for the man to get so overjoyed about the healing that Jesus just gave him that he forgot to take the necessary steps in addition to that to continue moving forward in his life. And so Jesus reminds him, go and show yourself to the priest so that you can move forward with confidence. Jesus does the same for us when it comes to the ailment of sin, when it comes to the salvation that he gives us to eradicate that sin. Jesus has healed the disease. We are healed right now. When he said on the cross, it is finished, that was it. Sin's dominion no longer has any power or authority. Once that happened, we had undeniable proof that Jesus had healed all people. But Jesus also commands all people to receive that blessing by faith, to follow him in his word, that he who believes and is baptized shall be saved, that by faith you have been saved, and so Jesus points us in the right direction. He does that through his word and through the words of many witnesses throughout history. He told us through Moses in Deuteronomy, Teach my commandments to your children. Speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by your way, when you lie down, when you rise up. It's pointing us in the right direction. He told us through Solomon in Proverbs, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he won't depart from it. Keeping us on the right direction. He told us through Paul, when he, Paul wrote to Timothy, Continue in the things that you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And he told us through Jude, second to last book in the Bible, But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jesus has not only healed us through the forgiveness of our sins, but he points us day by day in the right direction. The question we need to ask ourselves, are we going to listen to those words? Or are we going to hit the wall? None of us doubt the power that Jesus has. None of us doubt his ability as our Savior and what he has done for us. But it's the little things in life that we doubt. Does he care about me? Is he going to listen to my prayer? Does he know what's best for me? Is his word really the right path to follow? 
remember, not only to trust in the power, but to trust in your Savior's ability, to trust in His will, to say, I am cleansed. Now, I am willing to follow you. I will listen to you. I will let you guide me. I will listen to how I can move forward with confidence. When it came to Micah and his finger, we were able to put the band-aid on. He had confidence that Jesus would heal him, but he didn't listen to the instructions moving forward. He ripped the band-aid off and he exposed the wound and he hindered the healing process. Soon after, he needed a new band-aid, and I think he needed three or four after that one. The same can be applied in our spiritual lives. That Jesus can heal us both physically and spiritually is not a question in doubt. We know his power very well, but are we going to listen to him? What keeps us from picking away at the bandage of our forgiveness? What keeps us from becoming complacent in our spiritual lives? What keeps us from hitting the wall? Trust in your Savior, but also listen to Him. Listen to what He continues to tell you. Listen to the commands and advice He gives you moving forward to keep that faith strong, to keep it growing, and to keep it the center of your life. The most important thing you can ever know in your life is that Jesus is your Savior from sin, that He has given you the forgiveness of sins free of charge. But move forward. Strengthen that gift. Build on the faith that He has given you by listening to what He says. Amen. Peace of God which surpasses all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.